I recently stumbled on a Joe Rogan clip that immediately caught my eye as a nutritionist and someone who deals with vitamins every day. It's called What are the real benefits of taking vitamin C and is part of an interview with carnivore MD Paul Saladino, where both talk about vitamin C's role in health, specifically how much is ideal and whether or not it helps with the common cold. Since that is a big part of what I talk about on my channel, I felt like I had to react to it. The interview has a lot of interesting talking points, but also a lot of things that I disagree with. So let's get into it. So in the 1930s, from 1935 to 1942 or 43, they did a series of studies. I think it was in Sheffield, England. I've got the study I can show you. And they had conscientious objectors to the war. And they had them take different amounts of vitamin C to see how long it would take to get scurvy. And doses as low as 10 milligrams of vitamin C per day could they, prevent scurvy. They experimented with conscientious ex objectives? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of creepy. 10 milligrams a day. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Medical Ten. experience carried out in Sheffield on conscientious objectors to military service. And wow. if you scroll down to the next page, Jamie. That's kind of creepy. That you'll see the doses. On them. But yeah. There was um, 10 milligrams of vitamin C will, will prevent scurvy. Yeah, so what Saladino is referring to here is the infamous Sheffield experiment, or actually experiments, done by the Sorby Research Institute in the UK. They were working with conscientious objectors, but they weren't forced. They all volunteered for the experiment. And what the researchers wanted to find out was the minimum daily requirement of vitamin C to avoid scurvy. The Sheffield experiment also included other trials, for example, to study vitamin A, but we will focus on the vitamin C part in this video. All 20 volunteers were put on a vitamin C free diet for six weeks, but they were also given a 70 milligram ascorbic acid supplement during that time. After the six weeks, three participants continued on the 70 milligram ascorbic acid daily dose, seven participants were given a 10 milligram daily dose, and 10 participants were given no supplement, so to induce scurvy in a controlled environment. The researchers then monitored the blood vitamin C levels of all the participants and saw them drastically decline in that group that wasn't given any supplements. All of the participants in the zero milligram group developed clinical scurvy within six to eight months. Their symptoms included skin hemorrhages, bleeding gums, and in some cases, internal bleeding as well. Also, small incisions that were purposely cut in the scurvy patients healed very poorly and some participants had to be given acute high doses of vitamin C because their symptoms were life-threatening. The researchers' conclusion after the Sheffield experiment was basically that a vitamin C deficiency not only led to problems in your connective tissue and skin, but also to life-threatening problems with your internal organs. This were at the time new findings and very interesting. Also, and Saladino already said this, 10 milligrams per day of vitamin C was enough to avoid these symptoms and avoid scurvy. Right, so, uh, but obviously that's not an optimum level for health. Well, we don't know. No? Yeah, because if you look at the, um, if you look at the, the amount of vitamin C, the, they, say, they say there that between the 70 milligram group and the 10 milligram group, there was no difference in clinical outcomes. The prevailing thinking is that 10 milligrams is not enough for optimal health, but we don't actually know. There are roles of vitamin C beyond the formation of collagen, which is the main thing that gets broken when we see scurvy, or at least that's the physical manifestations. You get bleeding gums, your teeth fall out. This is all collagenous tissue. The connective tissue in the human body starts to break down because you can't hydroxylate proline residues on the collagen molecule. Yeah, so it is true that the Sheffield experiment found no clinically significant health differences in the group taking 10 milligrams per day versus the group taking 70 milligrams per day. So based on the study, you could theoretically question the need for a higher vitamin C intake. But of course, Saludina himself states that there are other roles of vitamin C besides the formation of collagen. For example, you have its antioxidative properties because it helps neutralize free radicals and protect cells from damage. It is involved in energy production because it is involved in the synthesis of carnitine, which helps the body break down fatty acids and turn them into energy. It's also necessary for adrenal health and neurotransmitter synthesis. The adrenals actually have the highest concentration of vitamin C of any organ in the body. 
and vitamin C is necessary for the production of neuroadrenaline and adrenaline. Lastly, of course, you have vitamin C's role in immune function, but we will get to that later in the video. Now, in response to Saladino, Joe Rogan actually asks a very important question. What is the ideal intake of vitamin C per day? This is an age-old question that many studies have tried to answer. What you have to understand is that Saladino, as a promoter of the carnivore diet, will highlight those studies that find that a low vitamin C intake is fine for health. Obviously, this is going to be his argument because his diet is naturally lower in vitamin C than other diets, for example, a vegan diet that is high in fruits and vegetables. Now, I don't have a problem with people promoting whatever diet worked for them. But what you do often find in nutrition circles is that someone will point out a study that supports their favorite diet and omit research that runs counter to their diet. For example, someone following a high vitamin C diet would probably focus on other studies that showed benefits of a high vitamin C intake, for instance, in cardiovascular disease or cancer treatment. What I'm trying to say is that the research on individual nutrients is often conflicting and kind of a mess. There are so many studies on vitamin C that you can substantiate basically any argument depending on what research you focus on. I would even go so far as to question the premise of the question, what is the optimal vitamin C intake itself? Optimal for who? The key to improving your health with any diet is to keep in mind nutritional bioindividuality. We all have different levels of certain minerals and vitamins, and those need to be kept in mind when designing a meal plan. Trying to find the ideal dosage for everyone is like trying to find the ideal shoe size for everyone. It works for the average person, but backfires for everyone else. We also haven't talked about the different forms of vitamin C, which is another rabbit hole I go into in a different video. What about the benefits of vitamin C in fighting off uh, colds and infections? Right. The, um, so the interventional studies with that have generally failed. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. But the oh. consensus wisdom is that like, if you have a virus, right, take, take vitamin, vitamin C. C. Take vitamin C, yeah. I'll show you this one. So if you go to the vitamin C folder, Jamie, and then you go to the vitamin C from an evolutionary perspective study, you'll see a, a list of all the interventional studies with vitamin C. Scroll down to the table two. So one more table down. That one. So you'll see these are interventional studies with vitamin C and... Um, there's an RCT there for um, the common cold. It's a meta-analysis, actually, which uh, 11,306 participants, and there was no effect on the incidence of the common cold. This is another very common research question. What is the effect of vitamin C supplementation on the common cold? The study Saladino refers to is not actually a meta-analysis itself, but a paper that references certain meta-analyses. This is the paragraph he mentioned, where the authors state, that the meta-analyses done on vitamin C didn't find any effect of vitamin C supplementation on the common cold. Saying this would actually oversimplify the data, but as you will see in a second, the paper also clarifies this later on. So I'm not criticizing Saladino nor the authors here, but if you were to read just this part of the paper, you would get a wrong picture of the data. No effect, uh, no incidences, uh, no effect on the incidences of the common cold, but what about once someone has a cold I that is like when emergency and all these different vitamin c uh, supplements this is what they're always claiming is that taking it while you have the cold is what's going to reduce the uh, duration of the disease concluded that vitamin c supplementation has no effect on the incidence of the common cold however a modest reduction of symptoms was consistently found in reviewed studies yeah so maybe so so good while you have it. Maybe while you have it. So if you have something, it. then jack up the dose. Yes, that is pretty much what the scientific consensus on vitamin C and the common cold is right now. I summarize everything in a different video in more detail. Basically, if we extract what the studies and meta-analyses have found, it is that people who start vitamin C when they already have a cold don't see much benefit and only in very high doses, so several grams of supplements. People who take vitamin C regularly can expect shorter colds with slightly less severe symptoms. And a few studies also showed that athletes who take vitamin C daily 
were half as likely to catch colds when compared to athletes who took a placebo. For example, ultramarathon runners were given 600 mg and after the race, one-third of the supplement group got sick compared to two-thirds of the placebo group. Again, if you're interested in taking vitamin C to boost your immune function, make sure to check out my video. I actually disagree with the consensus here and believe that you can see great results with it if you take it correctly. So together with other nutrients and necessary cofactors that were not studied in the research. Vitamin C is a complex one because there are many things which can lower vitamin C as well. So metabolic dysfunction decreases levels of vitamin C in our body. So the playing field is not always level, right? Okay, so if you have a cold, your, your vitamin C level is going to be lower. No Could matter. be lower. Right. Or if you have a baseline of unhealth, something that's been super relevant with the current conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have a baseline of ill health or baseline of metabolic dysfunction, sometimes synonymous with insulin resistance, per a given vitamin C intake, there's lower levels of vitamin C in the body. This is a great comment. All kinds of health conditions affect your ability to absorb and use vitamin C in the body. Saladino talks about insulin resistance, which is one important factor. But because I talk about other things on my channel, for example, chronic fatigue and related conditions, I would highlight the role stress plays in vitamin C use, both emotional stress and oxidative stress. And I would also look at your adrenal health and heavy metal burden. All of these deplete vitamin C or require a higher vitamin C intake than the current RDA. And you also always want to look at nutrient relationships. For example, copper and vitamin C is a very important relationship. People with too much copper will benefit from vitamin C, whereas people with an existing copper deficiency will react negatively to it. So if you look at animal foods, like if you eat nose to tail, if you're eating a couple ounces of liver per day and some meat per day and other organs, you can get pretty close to 70 milligrams of vitamin C a day, which is basically the RDA. I think the RDA might be 70 or 90 milligrams of vitamin now, C. Now, this, this expression, nose to tail, a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. What, you, what you're talking about is organ meats. Yeah. Yeah, is eating organ meats because most people, when they think of eating animal products, they think of just eating tissue, muscle tissue. It is no surprise that Saladino promotes organ meats because he's very big on carnivore. I personally don't follow the carnivore diet, but I also don't promote one specific diet for everyone. Again, I prefer to look at someone's nutrient levels and then tailor their diet to their individual levels. But if it worked for him, that's totally fine. Nose to tail definitely makes sense in terms of nutrient variety, but please keep two things in mind. One, if you eat a lot of organ meats, try to get the highest quality ones you can find. Many contaminants and toxic metals accumulate in the fatty tissue of specific organs. An obvious rule of thumb is that the healthier the animal, the healthier its meat. And two, make sure to check if you even should be eating specific organs. For example, liver is not ideal for people with copper overload because it is very high in copper and will add to that overload. In terms of organs highest in vitamin C, adrenal glands would probably be your best option. It's actually one of the ways Native Americans used to avoid scurvy. But of course, finding adrenal glands at your average supermarket is difficult, so I'm not sure this is realistic for most people. Great, to wrap up this video, what's my conclusion on the interview? Overall, I found it to be super interesting. Saladino makes some very interesting points on vitamin C and its ideal intake. I always like to hear new and unique perspectives on a given topic, but of course, because of his carnivore diet, Saladino will imply that a low vitamin C intake is fine for most people, which is something I would generally disagree with. But of course, this is a controversial topic, so make up your own mind. Like I said before, it always comes down to individual nutrient levels and requirements, which is why trying to answer super broad questions like how much of something is ideal for everyone is kind of a meaningless question to begin with. I hope you liked this video and I will see you in the next one.